Francisco's cable cars are 150 years old. I've told their story in another film. Here, we're going to take a look at what makes them tick, or rather, clank, rattle, and roll. The subterranean cable moves at a steady nine and a half miles per hour. The cars aren't permanently attached to it. They grip on to start moving. When the system opened, the initial grips used a screw-down mechanism. But a few years later, engineer William Eppelsheimer developed the grip, which is still in use today. Most of the grip is below the cable car's floor. Only the operating lever sticks up above it. The lever has a catch handle attached to a ratchet, so you need to pull the handle before you can move the lever. The grip protrudes below rail level, through the slot in the road. There, two grip jaws enclose two dies, which is the part of the grip which squeezes the cable. In this example, we're starting with the cable dropped, which means the lever is all the way forward. This is how you'll find it at a terminus. When it's time to depart, the cable car conductor will pull a trackside lever. This lifts the cable into the jaws of the grip. Now the grip man can move the lever back so the jaws tighten around the cable. At first, the cable is allowed to slip through the jaws. This makes a midway stop at a station simple. To get moving, the lever is pulled back slightly and the dies tighten on the cable. Now we're off. To reach top speed, the lever is pulled back again, so the dies are exerting maximum pressure on the cable. Because they suffer so much wear, the dies have to be changed every few days. Dropping the cable and picking it up is more common than you might think. Look out for signs like this near a terminus. Here the grip man is reminded to let go of the cable because they're approaching a turntable. Moving off the turntable, the track goes into a little dip. That's not just to help the car move, but to bring the grip closer to the cable. Here's the conductor pulling the trackside lever, moving the cable into the jaws of the grip. The cars on the California street line can be worked from either end, so they don't need a turntable. To reverse, they coast into a head shunt, and then the conductor still needs to pull up a lever to lift the cable into the grip jaws. As they depart, they pass over sprung points, moving them onto the correct running line. Under the slot, the cable sits in a channel. Every few feet, there's a pulley wheel to support it. As the grip of the cable car moves forward, it actually lifts the cable up slightly, so there's no danger of the grip and the supporting pulleys colliding. But cable cars are not made to run on the flat, and in San Francisco, they have to cope with frequent changes in gradient, which does make things a little more complicated below the slot. Here's an example. The cable still sits on pulleys, but where the climb starts, a pulley is actually placed on top of the cable, it's known as a depression pulley and holds the cable down. Otherwise, under tension, it will rise up and rub on the underside of the slot. As we've seen, as the grip moves forward, it lifts the cable off the pulley. As it gets close to the depression pulley, the effect is reversed and the cable is pushed off the bottom of the pulley. However, without some sort of mechanism, the depression pulley is still in the way of the grip going past. The early engineers came up with a solution. The depression pulley is mounted on a beam which has a pivot at one end. As we've seen, when the grip approaches, the cable is pushed downwards. When the grip reaches the beam, it forces it to pivot to the side, moving the depression pulley out of the way. The grip runs past without interference, and when it's gone by, the beam is sprung to pivot back into place, and the cable rises up again to engage with it. All of this happens out of sight, automatically. When the first San Francisco cable car line opened in 1873, it travelled in a straight line. Later innovations mean the cable cars can now navigate sharp corners, and there are two ways of doing this. The first is called a drift, or let-go curve. Here's a tight corner with the running rails, slot, and cable. The easiest way for the cable to change direction is to make a quarter turn around a large pulley before being guided back under the slot, now headed in a new direction. But the cable car still needs to follow the rails, of course. As it approaches the curve, the grip man drops the cable, 
The car travels around the corner under its own momentum, hence the term drift curve, and then when it's back above the cable, the grip man can reattach. But if you're turning a corner and going uphill, a drift curve won't help. New Zealand developed the pull curve and it was imported back to San Francisco. Here, the cable is guided on small individual pulleys. As the cable car grip approaches, the cable moves off the pulleys and a chafing bar located above and in front of them ensures the grip doesn't hit them. Now the cable car is under power for the whole turn. Again, look out for the signs to remind the grip man. Here the car is approaching a pull curve and the instruction is to take rope. You can spot a pull curve by the number of metal inspection hatches covering the small pulleys all the way around the corner. Climbing Powell Street, look out on the right hand side for the small octagonal cabin. This is the closest the system comes to having a signal box. It's needed because the California Street and Powell Street lines cross here. The Powell Street cable goes underneath the California Street cable, so it's vital the grip man on the Powell car drops the cable so the two don't interfere with each other. With just three cable car routes surviving, one powerhouse can handle moving all the cables. A motor powers a large driving wheel, called a sheave because it has grooves around its circumference. Next to it is an idler sheave, which is unpowered. The cable comes from the street and winds in a figure of eight around the sheaves to maximize the contact it has with them, reducing slipping. It then heads along the building to a tension sheave before heading back to the street. The tension sheave is mounted on a carriage with a counterweight. As the tension changes with cars attaching and detaching, it keeps the cable tight. The cable can also stretch by a hundred feet over its working life, so maintaining the correct tension is vital. Add the lengths of all four cables together and it comes to more than ten and a half miles under the streets of San Francisco.